Hi, and welcome to part three in my series about continuum mechanics. And today we're going to talk about the spectral decomposition of the deformation gradient. And the goal of this series is to give you enough information, as I mentioned earlier, to uh, read material model papers and theory and theory manuals so you can better understand how different material models behave. And in order to do that, you have to have some basis and some understanding of continuum mechanics, and I will cover that in this short course. So in my part one of this course, I talked about the deformation gradient. I introduced how it's defined, and I said the deformation gradient is really one of the key quantities in continuum mechanics and in constitutive equations. And in part two, I introduced invariance and eigenvalues, and I talked about how these work. And today I will continue with that discussion. Uh, remember though that the reason here I'm talking about the spectral decomposition, and that's really the goal of our uh, talk today here, is that it's a very useful concept because it indicates in what basis a quantity is expressed. And that really is what makes continuum mechanics more difficult at large deformations uh, a quantity will have a current configuration and a reference configuration, and sometimes the coordinate systems that you express these things uh, in are different. So you got to keep track of the basis in which different quantities are expressed. It's a reference configuration or the current configuration, and that's one, uh, one of the reasons I really like spectral decomposition. It's an easy way to demonstrate uh, how a quantity uh, is expressed in, in a different basis. So before we get there, though, I'll, I want to introduce a little bit more about the eigenvalue decomposition and how that leads us up to these specific uh, decompositions that I want to focus on in, in this discussion today. So let's talk about the eigenvalue decomposition just a little bit more from a numerical viewpoint. Last uh, part in my series, I said this is the definition of an eigenvalue. A is a 3 by 3 matrix. And what I've shown here is basically a very simple way in which you can demonstrate this using Python code. So the, the text on the left is Python code, and the text on the right here is what happens when you write the, uh, run this Python code. This is the output from the Python code. So I'm using the NumPy library from Python to just do the calculations. The first real statement here is to make a 3 by 3 ma a symmetric matrix, and that's my definition here. So I take a random a 3 by 3 matrix, and I, I add to it its transpose, when I add the matrix and it's transposed, it becomes symmetrical, and that's kind of what I'm doing uh, here. So that's really the, the first part, and then I just calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, in this way here. You can see that the, there's a simple call and it has two outputs, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. The eigenvalues turn out to be a, a, a vector, and the eigenvectors is, a, in this case, uh, summarized in the 3 by 3 matrix. And then in the end, I simply just multiply A with one of the eigenvectors, and I get back lambda times the eigenvector. So here it's all shown down here. We get the same answer. So that's kind of how you can explore this using uh, Python. And I do encourage you to try some of these things. It's, it's good to understand the theory, of course, but it's very useful to also have a better understanding of how this works numerically. It makes it more co concrete. You can kind of play with it and get a better understanding, I think. So, so I, I, that's why I'm doing these Python code examples here. Another way to think about this eigenvalue decomposition is to say we have a, a diagonal matrix in the middle, and then we have the same matrix before and after. And this uh, before and after Q matrix is an orthogonal matrix. So that means that if you take that matrix and multiply it with a transpose, you get an identity matrix. So here I just make an identity, uh, an asymmetric matrix again. I take the eigenvalues, and then I just form this quantity and calculate that. That's done down here. You can see how I create a diagonal matrix here, and then I multiply them together. And what's shown on the right is the initial symmetric matrix. I get the same value when I do this operation here. So this is uh, a simple way to do that. Now, the next topic is the spectral decomposition. Now, this is something that you can do um, as well. And this is one of the key, the key formulations that I want to get to. And this is how you do it for a symmetrical matrix. You sum over the eigenvalues, and these are the eigenvectors written with this dyadic product. And what I do here is I simply, in the code, I simply formulate and calculate this on the left, and the output is shown to the right. 
And the first thing is to create my symmetric matrix A that I'm going to, it's a random symmetric matrix that I'm going to work with. I calculate the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and you can see them uh, written here. This is the output from it. Then I extract the three uh, eigenvectors from this matrix that a Python returns. And then I formulate this quantity. One way to calculate the dyadic product here is with a Python called einsum. There are different ways to do it in Python. This is a convenient way that I sometimes use. And then you add these three together, and I get back the initial A uh, uh, matrix in this case. To so demonstrate the numerically that this, this works, and this is a simple way to demonstrate that. Now, what I really wanted to get into today is the singular value decomposition, and specifically talking about the deformation gradient, which is what drives polymer mechanics and constitutive equations. The problem with the deformation gradient, and one challenge with it, is it's not symmetrical. We can't do a eigenvalue decomposition of an unsymmetrical matrix. You end up with complex numbers. But we want to, so we want to use something else called a singular value decomposition. So singular value decomposition is very similar. We have a diagonal matrix in the middle, and then we have a pre and post multiplication by, with orthogonal matrices. But in the singular value decomposition, the pre and the post uh, pros, uh, uh, rotations here are not the same. They are different, and that's why the, this, this is done this way. So here's my example again. I create a, 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 a test matrix here, and you can see it printed out over here. I selected something that is pretty much just a, a shear. It's kind of like a simple shear example. And then I did the single value decomposition here with this SVD, a function of the NumPy library in Python. And then I print out these variables. Uh, the, the SVD decomposition returns three things, three matrices. They're basically as Q1, Lambda, and Q2. And then I just multiply them together to show that if I do this numerically, I end up with the same matrix that I started with to show that this, this kind of works, this is something we can do, and this is something that's easy to do numerically. Let's do a little bit more math now. The singular value decomposition have this pre and post multiplication by rotations, the orthogonal matrices. And we can write lambda here with this form here. So what we have is the in single, um, here's the eigenvalue, and then we have this identity uh, dyadic product. And then what we see, we can take these Q uh, tensors of matrices and put them inside the summation. They end up being here and here in that case. And now you can show that this vector here on the left is not the same as the one on the right because Q1 and Q2 are not the same and F, if F is uh, not symmetrical. And that's why the the single value decomposition of F becomes this equation down here. And this is a very useful and important equation. I will talk about it uh, more today and, and in future uh, discussions. The, the, one of the key observations directly is that the, the basis vectors here are, are different. We have lowercase n and capital N. And that is a, a, an important consequence of, of how the deformation gradient is defined. Now, let's talk a little bit more specifically about things we care about when we want to develop material models, such as strain, stress, stretch, and rotations. I'm going to start with, with the rotations and the, and the deformation gradient in, in different ways here. Um, as you may know, that any general deformation can be decomposed into rotation followed by stretch or stretch followed by rotation. And that's very important, of course, because that if you have a rotation of, a, of something, an object you're interested in, rotating it doesn't cause any stresses, doesn't cause any strains. It's the stretching. So we need to separate stretch from rotation. And here is the, how it's typically done. The deformation gradient is either first stretched and then rotated, or first rotated and then stretched. By, by definition, then, we can see that the U tensor here is expressed in a different basis than the V tensor, because U is first applied, in this case, in that case here, we first rotate and then we stretch. So this will be a different coordinate system that the V tensor is expressed in. And that's something that comes out directly of this decomposition idea that I will talk about here. And the R uh, here is orthogonal and volume conserving, as always. And what I will show here is that what's kind of interesting is if the if you define this quantity, you take the deformation gradient and multiply, uh, pre-multiply it by its transpose, something almost magical happens is that you take this definition here of the deformation gradient and you take the transpose, you switch the order, so it becomes U transpose R and then RU. Since R is a rotation in an orthogonal 
matrix, R transpose R goes away, it's an identity. So we end up with a quantity called U square or C, which is the right Cauchy Green tensor. And that is independent of rotations. It's a symmetric tensor. It's kind of cool. It's very useful. And it's also expressed in the reference configuration, as, as one can argue, based on this, this uh, equation up here. Similarly, if you take F and multiply it by its transpose, the R goes away, away too, and you end up with a V tensor, a V square, which is also defined as B, the left Cauchy Green tensor. So this is very useful too. It expresses uh, the deformation in a, in a way that does not contain rotations. And as you can imagine, strains will be defined from these uh, Cauchy Green tensors. I will de demonstrate that in my next uh, video in this series. What we can do though, we can do a little bit more math on this and particularly look at the spectral representation of the deformation gradient now. So F uh, here is what we had before, and I just uh, ex expanded the sum here. So there's a sum of three terms, and here they are. And then I wrote down the F transpose. The transpose you is switched order here between those basically, so it's very simple. And uh, here they are in the end. What we want to calculate in this example is uh, C, uh, and that is U squared, which is the same as F transpose F. And then you see, well, you have to operate between uh, these three uh, um, matrices uh, and these three matrices. So you end up in nine terms when you do the matrix multiplication of these. It turns out that almost all terms uh, are cancel out or they go away. And um, you can see that in different ways. Um, the first thing to remember is when you take, say, the first term of this one, the first term here and multiply it by this one here, um, or the, actually the opposite order, the bottom one multiplied by this, you're going to have this dyadic product of two of the, two of these together, and you may uh, want to know that this definition or, or this equation shown here at the bottom is, is uh, valid, and this is what helps us out. When you have a, a dyadic product B, and then operating that on C dyadic product D, the the, the resulting matrix or, or will have the first and the last term here end up on the right. And then the interior terms B and C are the dot product that's, that will give the magnitude of them. And if you take this one and, and this one and this one, there will be the capital N, that's the first, and capital N1 is the last, and that gives us this part here. And then we have lambda square. So that will give us the first term here. And it, all the other ones will have uh, products, dot products that go away. So that's why this becomes so simple and pretty uh, elegant solution. So we we'll see that the C tensor here is lambda square, and then it's a symmetrical, in case capital N is the basis vectors. Similarly, the left Cauchy Green tensor is the, defined by this one, it's F transpose F, and it's called left Cauchy Green because the deformation gradient F is to the left of the transpose, and that's one sort of memory rule to, call, to remember that. If you do the math on all of this, you end up with this equation here. It has the same uh, eigenvalues here, but it has a different basis vectors, and there are different uh, rotations between them. And we can connect that up a little bit more in our next um, uh, series in this um, series. So to summarize, what I've shown here today is uh, really three of the key equations that are a little bit mathematical in some sense. And what we will do next is we will use these to define strains. We will really tie this all together in a nice way. So we were forced to do a little bit more math here initially, so we can use this in a more productive way later. So this is the spectral representation of the deformation gradient, and then the two uh, Cauchy-Green tensors. If you have any questions on this, you can ask them below.